just I have one small announcement. I mean, this is the last uh, lecture of the school in terms of lecture. There will be two, three things that should be interesting for you uh, if you are interested in this topic uh, tomorrow. So the first thing is that Vincent, who's here as part of his master's thesis uh, in, in Paris, uh, will present uh, what he just read about, uh, <laughs> about uh, what goes on in the uniform spanning tree model. So uh, remember, a uniform spanning tree is a model where you choose at random on a graph a configuration that has no loop, but only one connected component. And so what, what, what he will tell you is, first of all, uh, that this is indeed you know, part of this uh, F random cluster models when you let Q go to 0, and uh, so that it's at criticality. So it's indeed something that is part of this general FK models, uh, random cluster models that we talked about in, in Smirnoff. Proof that it, uh, and then that there's a nice algorithmic way to construct it, which is called Wilson's algorithm that he will explain to you. And Wilson's algorithm, I just mentioned uh, before the loop soups, is you know a way to create simple paths uh, by erasing loops of a simple random walk. And so this means that you can construct uniform spanning trees out of simple random walks. And uh, this. Will, so he will show you just the intuitive idea sort of why it is possible to understand the scaling limit of these models. Uh, because there's a simple observable that you can guess that you see out of Wilson's algorithm that just has to do with simple random walks. You know, it's the probability that a simple random walk does this or that can correspond to a probability of, uh, in terms of a spanning tree and therefore in terms of some exploration process and because simple random walk converges to Brownian motion, this is okay to get a conformally invariant uh, quantity. Uh, so we will not give a full proof, but uh, so for those of you, for instance, who have my saint flow lecture notes, this is the part corresponding to loop arrays, random walks, and uniform spanning trees. But what he will explain to you is just you know the combinatorial part, which is Wilson's algorithm, and then why, sort of intuit on intuitive level, why uh, it is clear that this should lead to a conformally invariant observable for, the, for that model. So that will be at 9.30 sharp tomorrow morning. Uh, I don't know where, uh, here. here. So uh, I'm not sure to be able to be here myself. So it's nice if he doesn't speak in front of an empty audience. And anyway, I think it's very good for, for uh, as a good complement of what you've so, seen so far in terms of uh, convergence to SLE6 and so on. You would prefer today after today? So yes, I mean the, the who... So who, who can come who can come tomorrow morning at 9.30 and who will come? Let's put it this way. Okay, well, good. No, I mean, I, I really believe. Okay, anyway. Makes really sense. I mean, as a complement to the. No, majority is okay, probably both. But if there's a competing other seminar that you want to rush to at I don't know what time. Uh, ah. 
Okay, so tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, okay, so what I want to say in the remaining time is about uh, yes, Gaussian free field. So one uh, person in the audience said, "Well, is there a way to view these uh, loop systems?" as level lines of uh, random surfaces. Right. That was, you know, we, we all have seen loop systems like this. Uh, if we look at a map, you know, which has a height, then we know that, you know, where you go, uh, these are level lines, and you have these concentric loops, and so on. And so it's a very uh, natural thing to try to say, Suppose that you have a, a CLE, right, with all the concentric loops. And suppose you say, well, uh, each time you hit a loop, it's either, you know, higher than the previous one or lower than the previous one, and you, that you toss a coin. You know, that you go up or down by a factor of one each time you, you cross a loop. Then, then the picture, you know, is that of a landscape. know, where roughly you can view this as a picture of a landscape. Well, it's not exactly a standard landscape, because there's one thing you can uh, clearly see, is that I fix a point in my picture. In the CLE, it's very simple to see that almost surely it will be surrounded by a loop. No, almost surely there will be a loop around it. That's a simple exercise here, so that basically the Lebesgue measure of the space left between the loops is zero. The reason is simple, right? It's just because I take a point here, z. You know, I cut something out, and I have a positive probability here to have a loop that surrounds it. If I don't, you know, I just take the smaller domain and I start again. So, you know, either you lose or you can play again, and you play again the same game, so eventually you will lose, and, and you will be, a given point Z will be surrounded by a, a, a loop, almost surely. So it will be surrounded by a loop, and then, because we're using this concentric thing, it will be concerned by a second one, the third one, and so on. So a given point will be surrounded almost surely by infinitely many loops. And at each time you cross a loop, you toss a coin to decide if you go up or down. So what sort of a landscape is this? Well, every point, I mean, a given point has no height, right? Because it's, it's the limit, you know, of successive uh, infinitely many pluses and infinitely mi many minuses. Doesn't make any sense. Still, uh, it makes sense, uh, and maybe I spent some time uh, explaining this. Uh, in fact, this height uh, picture that you see there, that you define in that way, uh, is not uh, a random surface. It's something, it's a, but it's still random distribution. So that means if I integrate out, you know, this, this, uh, this height against the test function, then maybe it will be finite. Because maybe the contribution of the very small plus and minus guys, you know, they maybe they just cancel out uh, uh, on small scale. So let me just now start uh, describing to you what is a Gaussian free field. So Gaussian free field is, you know, one of the oldest also uh, models or things that field theorists have invented in physics. Uh, and uh, and interestingly, I mean, okay, I will try to explain that there were some certain mysterious things where there, there was some physical interpretation, but now sort of uh, that the light, you can shed a lot of light uh, on this using this, uh, these stories. So, um, may, maybe I, sh I, I just say a, a short sort of a historical uh, perspective, which is very much biased by my own uh, interpretation of, of things. Um, in, in the 70s, uh, there has been uh, 
a lot of work going on in quantum field theory. Uh, so in particular, you know, Young Mills problems and so on, you know, that, that's the moment where the, it has start, I mean, started. And actually, sort of a conformal field theory, this story that is related to what we were doing here, was somehow a spin-off of, of this main quantum field theory uh, stories. Um, and uh, in a way, a field, one way to view it if you are a probabilist, as you know, is something uh, analytic. It's some you know, function acting or, or some spaces. So there's no randomness in there, a priori. Uh, but you can view it you know, as being some expected values of some random unknown things, you know, if, if you are a probabilist space. So you, it's a little bit like this value f, this function f we had in the Ising model, which is what related to a conformal field. Um, and uh, probability theory was always, you know, uh, you know it's, it's like uh, the police in some of, uh, okay, I cannot make a <laughs> French jokes, but basically uh, uh, it always arrives too late, you know, after things happened, you know, they, <laughs> they just come to, to, to check, you know, later on what has happened, what has been going on. And in a way, you know, probability theory within mathematics uh, and physics also, you know, they uh, arrived and gave a nice interpretation of things, but things were already proved by other means. So, I mean, example is, your typical example is everything involving complex analysis, you know, Riemann and so on, you know. Uh, you can, you know, understand that Laplacian is a very important thing and so on. Uh, you don't need to know what Brownian motion is. You know, it took a long time before settling what actually, that Brownian motion exists, that it's an, I mean, what, what it actually means. Uh, before, you know, uh, saying, and, and, you know, Riemann's mapping theorem and all these Leuvenet chains and everything, you know, happened long before. So complex analysis was very, you know, proved many, many, many things long before uh, probability theory was, uh, I mean, modern probability was actually born. And, and the same is true for physics in a way because, uh, you know, if you talk to a physicist, they will tell you, yeah, Brownian motion was invented by Einstein in one of his 1906 or 5 papers. Uh, and they still use this as a reference, you know, to define to what, what, uh, what Brownian motion is. Uh, and so the mathematical formalism, you know, uh, which in some sense sometimes is very powerful, arrived too late and also did not sort of permeate in the physics community. Somehow the sort of you know, probab modern probability theory, stochastic calculus and this type of stuff is not something our, I mean, our physicists have great intuition, friends have great intuition, they know a lot, but, you know, they can invent conformal field theory and uh, do great stuff, and simultaneously don't know how to state properly Riemann's mapping theorem. You know, you know what can, is it true for any open set, or what only if the boundary of the domain is smooth, or whatever. You know, these things they are not really uh, they don't. But they have deep intuition about the physics. But still, you know, the the, the probabilistic interpretation, especially when it becomes you know about subtle things like what I'm going to talk about now, is something which is sometimes lacking. And, and in, in these uh, conformal, I mean, in these quantum field theories, you know, the game was to construct fields. I mean, uh, if, if you look at down what probability theory was about in the early 70s, uh, you know, people realized that, uh, you know, Gaussian spaces and Gaussian run variable was something nice. Because in order to construct a Gaussian, I mean, a, a Gaussian process, the law of a Gaussian process, you got it for free, you just had to define the covariance function. So these were objects, you know, that you c where, where there was a lot of uh, interaction, could be a lot of interaction, could be, you know, very complex things. You just have to define a covariance function, you know, which, uh, and this is sort of easy, and you, then you can start work with that. And, and so the, 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 the simple observation that you can make is that if you take a, if you have a finite, if, if you have a fi bounded domain, the D, so this is what work, it works in any dimension, and if you define the Green's function g of x, y, remember this is sort of more or less the time spent by Brownian motion starting from x, spent, the time it spends near y before having to exit the domain d. Um, 
that if you have Green's functions, they you know they formally satisfy these uh, covariance uh, uh, properties. You know that uh, you know there's a bilinear form that has to be uh, of a certain type. So if you have a Green's function of a Markov process, uh, basically this this will always be satisfied because you can interpret you know the sum of lambda i, lambda j, g of x i, x j as some squared time spent by something. So, um, so uh, basically, constructing Gaussian things was something nice, and then the question was, well, can we construct something else? You know, is there a way to construct a field that is not Gaussian? Okay, so then the game was, okay, we don't, you know, one of the problems we had in probability theory is that we don't have many tools you know, to construct stuff. Uh, especially, you know, if we want to construct infinitely many things that interact with each other, you know, either we prove, you know, like here that there's a scaling limit of some wild story like percolation or something, or you have Brownian motion or Gaussian stuff, and that's it. Or, the, or you know, you cannot, you know, construct a random probability measure on a big, on an infinite dimensional space line out of, you know, here it is. So, so the trick was to say, well, let's start with the Gaussian stuff, so the Gaussian free field, and perturb it. You know, let's put you know, some, some density with respect to the Gaussian free field. You know, let's try to perturb it slightly. So, and then this led you know, to sort of perturbation, a perturbative approach, and one of the big problem issues at the, point, at the time, you know, the Glim Jaffe type uh, questions or Barry Simon, was basically to prove that you can construct something that is not Gaussian, right, that you can, you know, and, and, and then this, the story is basically if you have something Gaussian, like if this is Gaussian d phi, right, then you might say, well, if I perturb it by set of uh, e to the minus phi, you know, this is still Gaussian, you just, just a shift of the first Gaussian, you just, uh, uh, you know, you put a radonic, and so then you just, you know, you start putting squares, on, and uh, this is still, okay, but you start putting polynomials, you know, small polynomials with epsilon in front uh, in here and seeing if this makes sense. So you have, you know, there was this question, you know, existence of P of phi, four, or, you know, type of things. What exactly having to do that if you perturb a Gaussian free field with a polynomial way, you know, that you get uh, non-trivial things that are not Gaussian. Um, so this is really sort of, you know, for them, for physicists, this is sort of, you know, the, the lowest level uh, field you could imagine. It's, it's a Gaussian free field. For us, it's a, a very rich object uh, nowadays, so you will see. So the idea is just to say this is a, a, a formally, you might say, this is phi of x. So this is a formal thing, an intuitive thing, you know, in, in, in the time I have, I can give you a... a detailed introduction to, to this, but formally this is a Gaussian process with covariance structure given by that. So this you say, well, this doesn't make sense. This, that's the first answer because what is that? So Gaussian process means, you know, that any linear combination of these guys is a Gaussian random variable. That's what it means to be a Gaussian process. So this doesn't make any sense because the, what is the covariance, I mean, what's the variance of phi of x itself is g of x, x, it's infinite. You know, g of x, y blows up when x goes to y. So this is the Green's function. So it's infinite. The Green's function is infinite uh, on the diagonal, so you, you cannot define phi of x. However, what you can define is formally you can define it for any, suppose f is a smooth function in D. You could define f with phi, so which is just basically integral of f phi in D. So you smooth out phi. So this formally would be a linear combination of the phi's, right? Because it's just integral with respect to phi in the domain. It's a linear combination of the phi, so you'd expect this to be a Gaussian random variable. And now, if you look at what the covariance function of this guy would be, so expected value of this guy squared, you would get phi, integral of phi of x, phi of y, 
g of x, y. That's what the covariance would be. The variance, you know, the variance of this guy, you know, you just expand this. You say this is dx times this times dy, right? And you use the fact the expected value of phi of x, phi of, uh, sorry, I have a, that the expected value of phi of x, phi of x, uh, phi of, uh, phi of y is just g of x, y. And then you get this as the uh, squared, I mean, the, the, the variance of, of this guy. And this is nice, because if f is a, is a smooth curve, right, this blows up like in the logarithmic way when x gets close to y. And so this integral still converges. You know, when, if you fix f and you vary y, you know, you're integrating some function times log of 1 over x minus y over space, so this converges. So by taking, you know, the average value of formally this average value of phi on a, here, you can define, uh, you can make sense of this. So this means that the Gaussian free field, so this guy, formally it's defined as a, you know, you might say it's, it's uh, defined like this, but it's not, this is not a collection of Gaussian random variable, it's a random distribution, if you want, you can view it like this, that has a Gaussian law. Another way to say is, the, the way you define it is to define all these random variables here as a Gaussian process indexed by, by f with covariance function given by this thing. Okay. So there are other ways to view this. One way would be to say that, to use the fact that you know, g of x, y has to do the Laplacian and that you can express these things in terms of Dirichlet energies by you know, saying uh, this is the inverse of the Laplacian, so you can you know, play a little bit. If f is, has a compact support in d, then you can you know, have things that show up like uh, you know, a gradient of f squared you know, would be the I mean, gradient of f, gradient of y that you would integrate on that. Anyway, so that's, so this means the following, that this guy, the Gaussian free field, is a random distribution such that basically for any, if you integrate it over any function f, against any function f, you get a Gaussian random variable, and you know the covariance structure, which is given by this story. So in particular, intuitively, phi at any at a given point, phi is not defined. You know, it doesn't make sense. It's infinite. It's okay because g of x x is uh, infinite. Now, um, what comes next? Now, or what do I want to explain next? Uh, okay. So Green's functions are defined. Suppose this is a Green's function. I mean, this is well defined for any mark of process. Uh, but suppose you are looking at Brownian motion in D. Brownian motion, so this is going to be really sort of a tourism on a double-decker bus, you know, or looking at the, <laughs> the city, you know, or a tour of Paris in 30 minutes, you know, just uh, very quick. Uh, this has to do with the, this is the Green's function of a Brownian motion. Brownian motion is conformally invariant in two dimensions. So therefore, the Green's function of Brownian motion inherits some conformal invariant I mean, properties. So, so this phi of x, this notion, you know, this Gaussian free field in D, has something to do with the Gaussian free field in D prime. Modulo the conformal map from D onto D prime. That I'm not calling phi because I would mess things up with notations. But you know, you have a you have a domain something that happens in D, something that happens in D prime, and the things are related to each other. And they are not. You cannot just say that it's the image because you know we define it. If you we define it as you know a distribution. So when I take the image of this onto some other domain, you see the dx will be changed by some factor phi prime. 
I mean, by a factor of uh, psi prime, if psi prime would be the, the, the covariance function. So um, you have to be slightly careful with what you mean by conform invariance, but it just inherits the, from in conform invariance of Brownian motion, it inherits a conform invariance property. The second thing that is important is that here, when you, when does this uh, converge? We know it, you know, this guy is of order log 1 over x minus y, right? The Green's function, that's the way it explodes when x minus y goes to 0. So in fact, for instance, if you would follow, if f would be sort of an indicator function on a line, you know, if f, you know, would be supported on just a line, it would not be a smooth function, but something, you know, much more singular that is supported on the, on the curve, then this will still converge. You know, because if you if you are on on the real line, if you integrate one over log, uh, I mean log of one over x uh, on R on near zero, this will converge. Right? Integral of dx times divided by log one over x, this converges. You know, the log is not it's exploding, but very slowly. So as soon as you spread out slightly your mass with f, this will converge. So intuitively, it's quite clear that phi is not only defined for smooth function, but it's also defined, you know, for as soon as the measure, you know, has corresponds, you know, spread more or less on, on some curve fairly nicely, you know, or corresponds to something of positive fractal dimension or, you know, then you're, you're fine, right? Because you just need to, buy, to beat the log uh, and this is as soon as, you know, the f corresponds to a measure, I mean, f of x dx here corresponds to integrate phi with respect to some measure which is supported on fractal set, uh, then you will be okay. So you can make sense of the value of phi, you know, along a line or along a curve. Okay. Now, here is roughly the statement. Uh, I t I take a Gaussian free field here. So note that there is one parameter that we can play with the Gaussian free field, which is just the constant that you put in front of phi. You know, it could be phi, it could be two times phi, three times phi, or in other words, corresponds, you know, to what constant you put in front of the variance here. Could be one, could be two, but then the difference is just, you know, one, one uh, after the other. So by the way, uh, there's a very nice thing about the, Gauss, about the Gaussian variables, you know, which has to do with projections. You know, we know that independence and projection in Gaussian, I mean, Gaussian spaces is the same. So, in fact, you know, if you have a Gaussian free field and you sort of uh, decompose it into some cells, smaller cells, you can some, some view, view a discretization of the Gaussian free, free field, which would be a discrete Gaussian free field, uh, that you can interpret just by, you know, projecting, you know, in each cell you just do some integration of what happens in the cell. And that will just give you, uh, by smoothing out, you know, in each cell what happens for phi in each of the cells, that would give you a discrete version of the Gaussian free field that would be a, a dis I mean, okay, discrete Gaussian free field. So, um, and so in fact, this fact that you was, this projection, you know, were, uh, converges to the continuous one uh, the discrete Gaussian free field convergence to the continuous one is something that has been studied uh, and used a lot by uh, Odette Schramm and Scott Sheffield. Uh, you know, there's a very long paper to appear, I think, in ACTA, which tells you the result, I mean, which goes into the direction of the result I'm going to state now, uh, and uh, that builds precisely on this fact that there's a discrete version of the Gaussian free field also. There's, I mean, there's a natural discrete model that is called the discrete Gaussian free field that is just viewed as a you know, projection of the continuous Gaussian free field by just taking averaging of the continuous one on, on smaller cells. And that is clearly, you know, and the, the continuous Gaussian free field is clearly scaling limit of its projections, you know, on finite dimensional spaces. So there's clearly a scaling limit there. So there's one additional thing that you can do when you have a Gaussian free field, which is to add to it a uh, harmonic function. So I have a Gaussian free field here, and now I take two boundary points A and B. And I have my Gaussian free field here. 
So one thing you can do is to define the Gaussian free field with boundary conditions, say, plus 1 here and minus 1 here, to be just the sum of your Gaussian free field with zero you know, uh, expectation, the sum of this with uh, the deterministic harmonic function that takes value minus 1 here and plus 1 here. So you know, you add to this continuous thing, you add something that is larger here, smaller here, and so on. Now, here's a, not, a theorem that is not easy. And I guess uh, the first one to, to uh, announce it was Schramm and Sheffield. And their proof, I think they are still uh, struck, I mean, writing up the last, uh, this is basically their second paper. Um, and this proof goes via the discretization, basically, proving that you know the what I'm going to say is well defined and discrete, and that the converge when you converge discrete to continuous, uh, things are fairly stable. And uh, but now there's an alternative proof uh, by Dubeda of the same type of statement. And the idea is the following: that you can find. So I give you a Gaussian free field. So I'm say, going to say that the plus one here is green and the minus one is, minus, is, is, is white. There's a way to explore the Gaussian free field. So there's a way to explore the inside of the Gaussian free field by a curve that starts from A. And this curve should have roughly the following property that conditionally on the curve up to some, t some time here. Conditionally on the value, I mean, on having discovered this, the expected, I mean, the, what is the value of the free field in the, in the domain? It's the value of the free field in the slip domain with boundary condition plus one here and minus one here. So in other words, this curve that you're exploring, you know, it's like a height gap. If you, if you would imagine that the curve would be nice, I mean, that the, the, this is still, you know, uh, a nice surface, which it isn't because it's sort of like this. It's, lo it's like, you know, here you have a cliff, you know, here it's height plus one, and here you have minus one, you have a jump. Right? And this just says that there's a way to, to you know, walk around the, the the cliff, and that this cliff, you know, will, will remain at constant height. You, know, you are always, you know, walking at height plus one. The sea will always be at uh, height minus one, and you can walk along the seashore, you know, in, 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 in such a way that when you are here now, you know that here you have the sea, and here you, have the, you are on the top. Now, the difficult part here, and the, the difficult statement, is to prove that in some sense, the curve gamma is a deterministic function of the field. Right. That if you know the field, you know, the way, this way to explore uh, the cliff such that the property I told you is preserved, you know, the fact that if I, I stop here, the law of what remains to be, I mean, of, of, of the field elsewhere is just the law of the guy with these new boundary conditions, that this way is basically forced. So the way Oded and yes. Would it be the same Yes, but here, of course, uh, yes. So it's an analogous statement, uh, except that you know we are in the, in, the, in the continuous already. So the way, uh, roughly speaking, I'm very simplifying a lot. The way Scott and Oded make it is just say, in the discrete setting, it's clear. You know, you just look at the the cells which are positive, the cells which are in average negative, and you, you go around like a percolation picture, uh, you go you know, along the cliff, and then it happens you know, that in average, the guys that are to your right and the guys that are to your left uh, remain of uh, constant height. And then you prove that when the approximation, discrete approximation, you know, the delta lattice goes to zero, this remains stable, and in some sense, you know, the cliffs, you, know, you, you, you cannot have you know, that on a certain, when for a certain subsequence you turn right, and another subsequence you turn left. So that's, that's the, the, the general uh, 
idea. What, the way Julien is doing it is uh, in a way more abstract and more uh, uh, I say, well, I like it. <laughs> uh, but it uses tools from other parts of mathematics that I cannot, you know, uh, explain to you now. You know, uh, so, you know, Julien is, you know, uh, putting his fingers more, you know, in some uh, algebraic geometric uh, stuff. Uh, but then, if you know, uh, you know what to catch there, then you know everything. You know becomes uh, okay. So basically, he's using some Polyakov, Alvarez regularization of some determinants and so what I'm saying is that basically once you hit here uh, and if you look at this paper then you know the, the you, you are really in sort of territory like with people Konsevich, Bismuth and that type of uh, people are you know moving around uh, and you are not you know uh, anymore you know just tossing coins or uh. anyway so but the nice thing is basically uh, he will he also makes uses extensively what I'm going to tell you a little bit later the fact that the Gaussian free field is also intrinsically related to the to the loop soup feature. Okay, so now there's one thing I haven't said, which is that um, this plus one and minus one is not quite correct. What happens is that the height gap, sort of here I said plus one minus one. Um, is basically there's only one height gap that works for each normalization of, of the free field. So roughly speaking, if I fix a normalization here, there exists exactly one value h such that this stuff works. So there is a natural you know, notion of height gap there. So what comes out of this picture actually later on, I mean, if you, if you think about it, uh, is that if I take a Gaussian free field which has no height gap, you know, with everything is yellow here, right? So that's sort of a Scott's type of things that he has to, uh, other things that he has to write up, uh, is that uh, basically then this, if you look at, you could define in the same way that here you can define cliffs, you can define cliffs inside the Gaussian free field that would correspond, you know, to, to, to level lines to jumps of the Gaussian free, I mean, jumps of the field here. You know that you inside the inside the Gaussian free field, you have moments where you go up by five, by two h or down by two h, right? and that in some sense, if I would take only sort of the yellow boundary conditions here, you know, by you know putting my fingers here, I would start exploring, finding out some cliffs and have can, could go around and so on. So that there exists inside a Gaussian free field, there exists a CLE. And what I didn't tell you, of course, is what the value of kappa is here in the, in, in what, okay, no, I didn't say what this, of course, I haven't told, I've told you there's a deterministic random curve here that you can define inside the, 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 the Gaussian free field. And that is really some sort of exploration guy. So it's natural to say that this curve gamma here, which is this, exploring this cliff, has to be an SLE. Because you have a conformal invariant guy, you know, I told you the, 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 the Gaussian free field was uh, had conformal invariance uh, built in. So what you end up is that gamma will be satisfy the exploration property because the Gaussian free field has a conformal invariance built in. It's conformal invariant, and therefore it should be an SLE. And for those of you uh, who remember or have seen, remember a little bit the computation, you should not be surprised that the value of kappa you get here is four. And uh, maybe I will tell you a bit later why, why it's four. Where this comes from. Um, so here, basically, there is a CLE four. At least intuitively, that's one 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 guesses that the, there are there are loops inside the Gaussian free field that correspond, you know, to high jumps of the Gaussian free field that are CLE four loops. So remember, CLE4 is the guy that we, is, is one of the guys that we had before. It's the critical one in, that we could construct with the Gaussian uh, Brownian loops before. So CLE4, so this tells you that a way to describe Gaussian free field, so this is a hand-waving description, but looks like uh, completely crazy. 
take a CLE4, you know, and, and put the, the continue, you know, like a, a nesting CLE4s one into the other. Toss a coin for each of the loops to decide if, it, if you go up by a factor 2h or down by a factor 2h on each of these loops. This defines a random height, height function in some way. And this random height function that you define, which is indeed, as before I told you, this, you know, this guy is not uh, well defined because you will have infinitely many loops around it. However, this defines a random height function, and you can just say that this guy you define this way. When you smooth it out, you just get a Gaussian free field. Right. So in other words, just, because, just looking at these height gaps, you know, just looking at these uh, functions, and it's very strange because everything looks like, you know, it's integer value, everything is multiple of h, you know, but uh, just looking at these height things, this structure, you can recover, actually, the Gaussian free field out of this CLE4. Well, I mean, it's a very perverse definition of the Gaussian free field because you need to understand what CLE4 is, but you, you, you see... Uh, uh, this is uh, <laughs> nice. But uh, anyway, so it's, it's just telling you that, you know, that there's a one-to-one -one relation between c the CLEs and the Gaussian free field. Now, there's a, actually what happens is that inside a Gaussian free field, you not only can see ca SLE4, but actually you can see all the SLEs. Uh, for all the values of kappa simultaneously, you can find the right SLE. And the reason is the following, is that roughly speaking, Maybe I should, okay, uh, time is running, so I, should, I, should, I, I won't have many of the other things to say. But roughly speaking, you could define something similar than this, except that you change the height gap, but you are going to compensate this height gap using something involving the winding number. You know, if you turn left or if you turn right, you know, uh, you are going to put a complex, uh, something complex in front. Reminiscent of the definition of f we had in the, in the easing model. Uh, I mean, definition. So there's a natural, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, so it's, it's pretty more complicated, but actually this is also contained in Julien's paper, this uh, approach. And I mean, Scott also was describing this uh, in the last, during all the last years uh, uh, with his approach. And so if you look on, if you go to Sheffield's webpage, you will find plenty of very nice pictures, you know, of starting looking at, because he can simulate nicely discrete Gaussian free fields. And so you can simulate approximation of all these things you can draw in these discrete versions. And so you have, you know, inside a Gaussian free field, you have all the SLE kappa, kappa minus six trees that you can see. So you, he has all the pictures, you know, where you go on his slides of his talks and you see all these different structures they are all you know, embedded in, in, in one Gaussian free field, and you have plenty of uh, <coughs> nice pictures that you can get there. OK. So there are a couple of things that I want to say uh, yet. So the Gaussian free field, uh, yeah, so why just about this winding story and to tie a relation with, because this also has to do with Smirnoff's. Uh, proof that we saw. Remember that in the, in the proof of Smirnoff that we saw, uh, there was uh, this fact that for each Q, uh, there was a natural spin, you know, there was a natural sigma, and there was a natural kappa corresponding to the conjectural SLE corresponding to the scaling limit of what it was. The spin sigma was the thing, you know, we had this observable that was expected value of indicator function uh, gamma goes through e, e go, yes, e to the i sigma uh, times uh, the winding number. You know, something like that. And in our case, for easing, sigma was uh, was uh, one half, and uh, this was the reason why there was this uh, you know even odd story about the uh, number of windings. There's still, there's always the fact that, you know, for each given edge here, the, the, you know, the orientation 
that you can travel on that edge is prescribed because of uh, you know, parity reasons. This is always true for any FK model. So, in, and the relation was, if I remember correctly, something like square root of Q over two was equal to cosinus uh, two pi sigma or pi sigma. pi sigma over 2. You have to help me now. I don't remember. Anyway, so there, there, was a, uh, there was a formula like that. You know, I remember I told you the nice integer values of Q correspond to the nice angles. You know, when Q... So, in particular, Q equals 4 is, is particularly nice because what is sigma when Q equals 4? Cosinus is 1. Sigma is 0. So sigma zero is a particularly nice case. This corresponds to kappa equal four. Sigma equals zero is a particularly nice case because that means that here this is zero, and that you're just looking at the probability that the observable is just the probability that you go uh, that e goes through gamma. Okay. So here something you know something is uh, is special for q equal four and kappa equal four that you don't have to take care, you know, windings of in, into account. You just look at the probability that you go through the thing. So this is reminiscent of the fact that here, the corresponding SLE here doesn't need to take care, into account the, the winding. The others, you know, they have to, you have to, you know, remember the value of F, you know, on the boundaries, you know, they, they had to turn uh, on the boundary because they, if you remember the way F was defined, you know, you had the square root thing and you had to, there was something, uh, on the boundary that, uh, yeah. When following the boundary, you know, you, the value of f moves with the angle of the boundary. So therefore, when you, uh, the of observables, you know, they have to be co covariant and to take into account this stuff. So this is just a very sort of a hand-waving uh, way to say that what we've seen in Stas, in, in the proof of the easy, conformal invariance of the easing model by Stas, the definition of this f and the properties that show up there, you know, they are the same, you, you see them reappearing here. You know, it's the same type of stories that reappear. And similarly, if you work directly on the SLE, if you work directly on the SLE, it's a very simple thing to see that the natural thing, you know, we have a point Z here, uh, you know, and you, you look at what is the, you want to estimate what is the probability to go through the neighborhood of Z. Well, you define GT, right? So here I have WT, here I have GT of Z. Okay. So I want to estimate the probability to go through some, to the neighborhood of Z. And I suppose that this will decay like, so if epsilon is very small, this will decay like epsilon to some power times, uh, epsilon to some power, because it has a fractal dimension of a certain, a certain fractal dimension. So here it's very not, so here you have epsilon z, so here we have epsilon g prime t of z. You know, that will be the, because you have a distortion when epsilon is very small, the ball now, you know, can grow or become larger or smaller. So the question here is, is there, you know, is there an SLE such that, so what this has to be, and is there an SLE and uh, an alpha? such that g prime t of uh, z divided by g t of z minus w t is a martingale. Yeah. Because you want to look at the probability that you go roughly through there. I mean, that's one formal way, you know, to see for each uh, okay, well, I, I should not be too, too ambitious. Okay, I, I think this, I, I, I will go into computation that will lead uh, uh, to some uh, problematic uh, cases. 
But anyway, so if you try to look at these questions, you know, that's one way to guess what the actual dimension of the SLE curve actually is. So the fact that you have to renormalize here, because you want to renormalize in such a way that this guy here still has the right. Uh... Okay, I should. I, I, I went it. Sorry, I shouldn't have told you that. I was just just meaning to say that there's a natural rephrasing, you know, in terms of, of properties of that sort in terms of the SLE to recognize what sort of uh, SLE correspond to what you would get what you would end up here to have the right, you know, uh, scaling uh, corresponding to the Gaussian free field. So here, basically, you are saying, well, when, when is this a martingale? And then you see this is a martingale only if uh, kappa equals 4. Okay, but. So I, I want to say two more things. So here we have the Gaussian free field right, and the conformal loop ensembles. Roughly, I, I, the Gaussian free field is a very rich... Uh, structure, uh, because everything is in one Gaussian free field, right? So all the SLEs and everything you can, you know, if you look at the right thing in the Gaussian free field, you will see uh, uh, what you're looking for. Um, the conformal loop ensembles, um, uh, they have different constructions, you know, the SLE, kappa, kappa, minus six construction, and so on. And they have the Brownian loop sub construction. Now, of course, I have a sort of biased uh, 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 view, which is that I like the Brownian loop soup construction. It's <laughs> just like that. I, I like this. And one reason I like it because is because uh, in some sense, it has a physical meaning. Uh, you know, if, if you look at quantum field theory, they use propagators. They use this type of, uh, I mean, they, they, um, field theory. You know, my, I mean, roughly speaking, like, let me just say something very uh, provocative and intuitive, which is, you know, what is the difference between the mathematician and the physicist? Or oh, well, that's just maybe my, my own personal experience. Uh, you know, uh, you learn Newton's law, and uh, you are told that that's the way it works, and everything is nice. Uh, that's how the the Earth turns around the sun, it's because you have Newton's law, and, and you see, and you have ellipses, and you're happy. Okay. And you say, well, I mean, this, so why is it Newton's law? Right? Why is it 1 over x squared? And then you might say, I mean, then you might argue, but it's the only way, you know, energy preserved, whatever, otherwise doesn't work. Or, okay. That's one answer. And the other answer will say, well, um, I mean, but how does it work? I mean, you know, how, how could it be, you know, that the Earth and the sun were far away from each other? You know, what is going, you know, what how do the, does the information go, flow from one place to other? So you, you always start saying that, you know, you, you go to this smaller, you know, block and you say, I still don't understand how this works, you know, and then you go to see our physicist friend, theoretical physicist, and say, okay, did explain me, you know, <laughs> how does gravity work? So, well, this is terribly complicated. Uh, maybe now we're going to see gravitons and so on. You know, then they start, you know, but it's always very vague, but then you say, well, I mean, Okay, Newton's law has to do with Laplacian, has to do with, uh, you know, uh, so. Uh, and if you are a probabilist, you know, like the bias of, uh, that's the trap of all of us, you know, when there's something you understand well, you want to explain the entire world, you know, using the little piece you understand because you, you claim this is the clue to everything. Uh, but still, you have the feeling that maybe, you know, there, there is some exchange of information that goes, you know, in the Brownian way or in first approximation, you know. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, we get Newton's law because the potential uh, is that of a Brownian motion and harmonic functions have to do with uh, Newton potential and so on. Okay, so, so far, so good. But then you say, well, I mean, these conformal field theories, what could, you know, and now, now you have this idea that, you know, you have something that propagates, that you have, di you have guys, you know, that, you know, these brown loops is, is still something fairly natural after all know that you have some information that goes around or around these random loops and then this thing will try to propagate and then okay so so maybe you know there is some okay I, I guess the probability is, is 0, 0.000 or something uh, but maybe you know there is some at least for us intuitively some physical uh, content for a mathematician you know in, in, into these uh, field theories that now, 
Here's a funny, very interesting observation by, uh, by Yves Lejean. And, uh, and the observation is the following. Uh, I mean, he did, uh, was, if you look closely at what the Brownian loop soup gives you, right? So, or more generally by if what a, a soup of Markov, you know, this structure, you know, of loops and the fact to put a weight four to the minus n to the loop of length n. This is something you could just define for any Markov chain by saying the probability of a loop is the probability that the chain goes around the loop, right? And then this probability that the chain goes around loops is just the product of the, pro the probability transition, the, uh, uh, transition probabilities around the loop, and so it doesn't, has no root, and so we can define this stuff for any uh, loop, uh, for any Markov chain. And um, there is something, you know, in the literature that is also was also invented uh, more or less at the time because there's a guy called Dinkin, uh, you know, who was very, you know, exactly, you know, sitting at this uh, quantum field uh, and Brownian interpretation of this quantum field uh, uh, theory approaches. Okay, when I say a guy called Dinkin, you know, maybe you are young, you don't know what I mean, but you know, it's it's one of our the heroes of uh, of the community. You know, yeah, Keston and uh, this type of, uh, and uh, and so there's something called Dinkin's isomorphism theorem, which is something that tells you that if you have some squared Gaussian stories, you it has an incarnation in terms of local times over a certain Markov process. And it looks a mysterious identity in law between uh, complicated things. Uh, actually, here there's a very simple explanation of this that shows that you can, in some sense, there's a direct relation between a Brownian loop soup and a Gaussian free field. And the direct relation is roughly the following. And I, I, maybe I, 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 I don't write it up because it's still uh, recorded, so I don't want to be caught by uh, writing up stuff you know, that, uh, that people will then say it's not well defined and so on. A Gaussian free field is a distribution like this, right? It's a Gaussian object. So now I want to defer, define the squared, the square of the Gaussian free field. So first reaction is say, I mean, you know, the Gaussian free field is something that is not defined as plus infinity, minus infinity, all over the place. It just makes sense because these plus and minus infinity are, you know, balanced out in some way when you integrate them out. So it doesn't mean anything. If you take the square, you get something that is plus infinity everywhere. It doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, Gaussians, you know, there, is a, there are stories about Gaussian random variables. There are, you know, things like uh, Vick products and this type of things that makes it possible still, you know, to subtract the mean of a squared Gaussian thing and to make sense of what you get there. And so you can make sense in some, uh, of basically what a squared Gaussian free field is. Now, statement, the squared Gaussian free field is just the occupation time of a loop soup. What I say by occupation time is just, you know, for a, for a set A, you know, do the sum of all loops gamma in the loop soup of uh, the time spent in A by gamma. Of course, this is, is also infinite because you have infinitely many loops. You know, by, by scaling argument, this will explode also. But also, you might you know, be able to do some uh, natural renormalization here. And the statement, and in the, discrete sta in the discrete case, this is also true, and it's a true statement, you know, that the Gaussian, you know, the square of the uh, Gaussian, discrete Gaussian free field is nothing else than uh, the occupation time of, of, of the discrete loops. So this indicates, you know, that when you go to the limit, something is left there. So that, you know, just by looking, you know, uh, uh, that there is a direct relation between these two things. Yes. I mean, he, he does other things also, but but so. Uh, well, if if you read his paper, you know, uh, uh, it's on archive. You. It's, uh, I should have really have, you know, at some point asked him to say, okay, give me the file and I will take it in such a way, you know, that the formulas don't go out of, you know, not three pages wide. And so, you know, it's a, he's, he's a, okay, but, uh, 
So there is here, there's one, you know, recent development that, you know, there's, there are direct relations between the Gauss, these loop soups and the Gauss free fields, and that actually this works for any Markov process, and that so actually the, 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 you know, the fact that here, why is it that it is very nice, that things are nice when you take Green's function of a Markov process, is because precisely these guys have an interpretation of loop soups of the corresponding Markov process. So uh, that somehow these free fields, you know, can be interpreted in terms of, you know, little loops of a given Markov process that floating around, and then you, you have uh, these green functions that show up. Uh, okay, that's that's one one direction basically where you see. A, uh, something direct, you know, that sort of all, I mean, all these different things, you know, are related to each other, and you are always talking, in some sense, the, 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 the lesson is that you always, you seem to be always talking about the same guy by different, looking at it by, in different ways, uh, because you always have the same uh, structure, and you can always construct one with the other, and the other with, with one. Now, of course, there, there are, I mean, but here, you know, in this global puzzle, there are several, you know, open questions, because uh, the fact that I the claim I just gave, you know, about occupation time uh, having to do with the Gaussian free field, tells you, I mean, gives you, is not restricted to any given, you know, value of the intensity of the Gaussian free field, of the loop soup measure. You know, this is true for the loop soup of intensity C0, also for 2 times C0, 3 times C0, right? Because then you add up, you know, there's this, there's this funny thing, you know, of, you know, this miracle, one of these miracles in, is this infinite divisibility of, uh, you know, when you take a squared of, uh, um, I mean, Gaussian, squared of Gaussian guys that are Green's, where the covariance is a Green's function and so on. Here it's quite clear, it corresponds just to the infinite divisibility of the, of the, of, of the loop soup. So here, this, in, in that, you know, bijection, there's no notion of special value of C or, or, or contours or whatever, right? So one open question, natural question is say, well, I mean, is there something, you know, more direct? Is, 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 the, is the, you know, the SLEs that you see as contours of the, of, of the clusters here, do they have anything to do with the, with the, with the level lines of the, of the Gaussian free field uh, that these occupation time guys correspond to or not. Could be, you know, that, you know, these two information are completely orthogonal and it so happens that you get the Gaussian free field anyway because it's conformal invariant and so on, but actually that, you know, that these construction with contours there is, is gives something completely different than by looking at occupation times. On the other hand, you know, contours are places where you know what the occupation time is on one side because it's zero in some sense, so maybe uh, still there is some something to say. But so another thing that we don't understand is basically how to uh, how to construct, for instance, the CLEs. So those with the guys that are touching each other, you know, when kappa is larger than four, you know, the, these clusters, you know, for instance, uh, clusters that touch each other, out of a Gauss of the Brownian loop soup picture, is it possible, you know, to even though there is one, I mean, okay, is, is there a way to make sense out of this? Or what is the relation between the CLE kappa uh, and CLE 16 over kappa? Say, you know, or, or, you know, you could just say that the, the green, the orange guys here are the outer boundaries of, a, of, of the clusters of uh, the other one because the clusters of the other one, uh, they will touch, so the outer boundary will touch also. So this, this cannot be just the outer boundaries of the uh, CLEs for a kappa larger than four. So maybe, you know, there's a natural thing which is um, uh, do some, you know, consider a CLE for kappa larger than 4 and do critical percolation on it by deciding to color the clusters with probability 1 half, 1 half, and maybe you end up with, okay, I, I don't know, it's just you have, there are many options, or maybe it's the other way around that you do critical percolation, these guys, so even if they don't touch, you may create, okay, I don't know. So that's, that's uh, one picture. So maybe I just want to conclude by saying that there's another uh, important development going on, uh, and again, Scott is there, so uh, you know he has a hard time writing up every, uh, at the speed at which he produces his ideas. And, and this has, is what is called quantum gravity, I mean, an approach to quantum gravity. So 
of course I cannot say explain this in 15 minutes uh, but uh, still uh, maybe I just say a few words about this just so that you see the that the Gaussian free field is, is very naturally there and in this type this time it's not the Gaussian free field is not the square but in some sense the exponential of the Gaussian free field so one thing where physicists and probabilists are actually now and also combinatorists have been very successful in all these two-dimensional models was to replace, you know, studying easing model or percolation or self-avoiding walks on the on z squared on the triangular lattice, was to replace uh, the natural lattice by a random lattice. So that means you look at your model, which is a random configuration, on the random lattice. You know, you sample at simultaneously a random lattice is something random on the random lattice. So that's what's called quantum gravity, basically, uh, because basically you have a fluctuating metric uh, also. OK, so it turns out that combinatorially, things are much simpler on a random lattice if you choose the right random lattice and associate it to the right random model. So for instance, just to give you an example illustration, you know, there are uh, you know, uh, by explicit bijections and the big name is Tut, who was somebody who, you know, proved, enumerated many uh, things, sort of combinatorial exact formulas for certain things. Uh, and so, for instance, one thing that you can compute explicitly is the number, so you fix, you fix M here, right? So you have M points here that are sitting on the boundary, and you can explicitly compute the number of uh, triangulations uh, of a domain with m boundary points and n points in the inside. So you see, uh, you can have a picture. Okay, it's, uh, okay, and so I, I don't continue, but basically you can enumerate exactly, you know, the number c of n m of. Uh, what is called the random triangulation of uh, a disk with uh, m boundary points. And there's an explicit formula for that. Now, because of the fact that there are explicit formulas for that, that means that you can also go explicitly to some limits and let some, you know, m go to infinity, n go to infinity, and control things. So in particular, in this random triangulation picture, if, if you try now, to, there, there's a natural thing you, you could do is, the notion of exploration process, right? An exploration process in a random triangulation is something which is very simple. Because in the finite case, I'm, I'm doing this, right? I, I, have, I have endpoints on my boundary. Well, that's, I'm using sort of a paper of uh, Omer Angel here just as a background. But there are many names, you know, associated with this, including you know, well, many people in France, actually. So. Uh, physicist group, uh, Di Francesco Enard, Boutet, uh, uh, how is it? Boutier, uh, in mathematics group community like uh, Mirmont, Le Gall, and these people, or Chassin, Schaeffer, Schaeffer is more on the commentorial side, Bousquet, Melou, so there are many people there. So here, the question is, you, you start here, say this is, you have a percolation picture, or, or you start exploring from here, you know, you imagine you do percolation here. So here the guys, this one is like this, this one is like this, and you basically ask the question, okay, I'm going to, you know, I have to discover what happens here. And I'm going to turn right or left depending on what I see there. Okay? You may have, you know, colored things in one direction or not. But so. so what you see, the first remark that you see is that you have two options, you know. Either the guy you discover is like this, or the guy that you discover is already on the boundary of what you have discovered so far, and then so and the triangle is here. Okay, what you can estimate exactly what the probability is that the tri that this is the point you're going to to find, right? Because what the probability of such a configuration? You know, you have to count how many triangulation you have with here these four points on the boundary, and n, and here how many triangulation you have in the remaining guy here. And then you can enumerate everything, and therefore you know you know what the probability is that that your new point is here, or the new point is any of one of these points. Right. 
And you know it, and actually you know it so well that you can actually understand what happens even when you let m go to infinity there, and n go to infinity. So you can understand basically this local evolution of local exploration of my triangulation, you know, in the spirit of uh, SLEs, by just saying, you know, at each step I, I discover my random triangulation, and I can discover, say, at random also the color of the thing and decided to, to go right or to go left here. And you can have a natural, you know, the, the exploration process here. Uh, ideas, you don't need conformal invariance because the triangulation, they don't, you know, they are distorted anyway. You know, if I explore, say, imagine I explore this, and I see this picture is here, so I go here. Uh, so this is here, so I go here. Now I, I want to explore the next guy here, like in the standard exploration process of percolation. Well, what is the, the law of what remains to be explored? Well, that's just, you know, a uniform measure on the triangulation, which have one less uh, sites there on top of it, but uh, one more guy on the boundary. You know, so the Markov, you know, the, the Markov, and, and of course, if you let M and N go to infinity, maybe, you know, you're actually always in the same situation where you, have, you explore a little bit and you still have infinitely many guys on the boundary, so you don't have to worry. And that's exactly what goes on. So that means that somehow in the, in the, in the, for these discrete planar maps, you have combinatorial identities in general much more complicated than this because you could look at quadrangulation, a triangulation, put an easing model on it, put percolation, put self-avoiding walks or whatever. But the, the exploration property, because of the fact that you're always averaging over all uh, random maps, I mean all you know, uh, graphs, makes that the exploration property is anyway there for you. You don't have to use conforming variance or something, it's, it's always there, right? So you can compute explicitly things in that picture. In particular, you can compute critical exponents associated to these type of pictures uh, in that framework. By the way, sort of, there's also a way to encode uh, random maps, planar maps in a random matrices uh, by just, you know, some combinatorial trick. So this is also one of the origin of random matrix theory. It has to do with these quantum gravity stories. You know, the former Ipsilon Zuber type, uh, uh, Brezin Ipsilon Zuber type uh, things in the early 80s and has been developed uh, a lot. So this is all related to random matrix theory. So what I want to say now is that there was this quantum gravity uh, toolbox that Duplantier has been using and says, you know, I understand things in the quantum gravity picture, and there's a uniform one-to-one -one bijection between uh, the exponents uh, in the quantum world and the exponents in the real world. You know, we physicists, we know that the exponents you get there, you know, are related to exponents you get in, this, in a stiff lattice by some magic relation. Now, what Scott understood, uh, and uh, together with Duplantier, now they they writing uh, something about this is actually that if you want to try to basically understand the scaling limit of these, okay, there are two ways to look at the scaling limit of these large random planar maps. One way is to look at this in terms of the natural, the original metric here uh, in terms of number, I mean distance here. So that's the, 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 the way, you know, uh, that comes out of the combinatorial method. So for instance, one thing that comes out of the combinatorial method is that if you take a random map, typically will be four-dimensional. So that, you know, the number of sites in the ball of radius R grows like R to the fourth. But it's still planar. So something is, you know, uh, something is slightly strange, you know, that. But it just means that in terms of, if you plug, if you force it in into a two-dimensional picture, then most points, you know, are sort of sinks where you, you have accumulation of points, but that as a two-dimensional structure, if you would put a random walk on it or something that, these points, you know, would not maybe be the, the points where actually things happen. Anyway, that's a very intuitive uh, statement I'm giving here. I don't know exactly. So what he understood was basically, imagine that there's a natural way, you know, to understand sort of to measure the metric or to measure, you know, uh, to view the scaling limit of this guy. The, the natural thing that the, this satisfies is that if you know how many points there are on this disk, you know, if you know how many points you have here, right, then uh, you know the law of the inside, roughly, because then it's, you know, random triangulation of a certain number of points. Now, if I would have a scaling limit, right, I would have infinitely many points here, infinitely many points here, infinitely many points here. 
And I could imagine you could define some annular type regions. That means that I have what happens you know, to, to the metric between here and here tells you, you know, how much more or less points do I have on this boundary here corresponding to here. Right? And if you imagine that you have a scaling limit, so OK, this is really, uh, I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically that naturally, if you want to have a scaling limit, you have some sort of Markov property that tells you, say, if, if somehow the, the metric takes some value here, that uh, the, the average value you have on this circle, the average value you have on the circle, the average value of the circle, the average value of the circle, right? So if this is x1, the average value, or x2, x3, x4, and so on, that basically x, you know, n would be the product of iid random variable because what happens in each of the annuli uh, correspond to uh, iid things. So that you have concentric things, you have a scaling limit, so therefore what happens to the metric has to be uh, have this type of property. So here, basically, locally, the metric at one given point is, you know, the product of IID stuff, you know, that when you zoom on top of it. So what is natural candidate is the exponential of the Gaussian free field, in some sense. Because this one is exactly, you know, it's Gaussian is sum of IID, so exponential is the guy that corresponds to the product. So this leads to the guess that the good candidate for you know what the limit of of the natural guy you have over there is uh, is is the Gaussian free field, and now you have a very nice uh, thing that tells you that that probably that's the right correct thing, uh, which is that one way to interpret this Knizhnik Polyakov magic Polyakov Zamorzhik of magic relation between. Uh, you know, what you can compute here and what you can uh, expose in the plane, plane, in the real plane, can be just interpreted in terms of um, as, as follows. That I am in, imagine that I am in, in the random world, right? I'm doing percolation in the random world, in, in the random graph world, or I'm doing uh, some model in the random graph world. The claim is, it's just the same as doing ordinary percolation in the real world, okay, but with this metric. That means that you choose at random a fractal set, you know, of a certain dimension. You choose at random, you know, a fractal set of dimension, uh, I don't know, D. Here. How does this dimension D transfer into my random world? In my random world, basically, uh, you know, most of the points, you don't see what's the size, basically, of this fractal in my random world. Well, the, some points in my fractal, you know, would correspond to points where the metric is small, and some points would correspond to some points where the metric is large. And because of the fact that phi is very wild, actually, you know, maybe some points, you know, would correspond to some regions where the metric is, is you know, ex extraordinarily favorable, you know, and blows up everything. And it's quite clear that when you choose a random fractal here, uh, the points that you're going to see actually here when you put the random fractal on this random metric here are not going to, uh, the, the ones that you, know, you will see in this metric are those who were on the random fractal but were exceptional points on the random fractal that were very lucky to end up in a region you know, where you know, e to the phi was, you know, playing a good game for you and, and blowing up things, making it very big. So if you just, so it's, you know, you have to have a random fractal and then the, the, the guys on the random fractal that will matter here will be those that we are lucky to fall into, you know, places where, where the metric was very, very favorable. So if you just do this unwavingly, so I don't know exactly what they can do on a rigorous level and I'm eager to see what, what, uh, what, what will show up. But at least this is surely true, is that if you define this guy here in a proper way, that if, uh, if you choose a random fractal, uh, you know, with fairly s of dimension d with very soft assumptions, then, then you know what the dimension of the random fractal would be somehow with, with in, within this metric. And you see that the, so that's the, the dimension, the new dimension, comes out, you know, it's just a large deviation property for 
Gaussian random variable. You know, it's just you know you have to 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 make a you know uh, it's just you know out of just a simple large deviation principle for uh, Gaussian random variable, you see that uh, the formula that you get out by this is exactly the quantum KPZ formula that physicists were playing with. So this is a very good you know hint towards the fact that indeed this guy is the correct way uh, to embed into the plane the random graphs that appear in the scaling limit there. So of course there you know then if you so there again there's room for many you know uh, things to do there because you understand well the random graphs in some respect but how do you control the scaling limits there and prove that this is the true but here at least you know there's one thing where you know what the right scenario is that's that's for sure and possibly actually they can maybe do other things there so but uh, that's that's quite clear that this is the picture and uh, Scott has other very nice arguments to explain why SLE comes into the game in that picture, how you interpret SLE here. And so, for instance, there's one nice uh, conjecture having to do that. If you embed, and possibly, you know, uh, he is closer to that, I don't know, that you, there's a natural embedding, you know, of a tri any triangulation has a natural embedding in the plane uh, where conform invariance is naturally there by just, you know, uh, you just declare, you, you just, de okay, you have, it's too late, but there's a natural embedding of any conformal, I mean, of any triangulation in the plane by just, you know, gluing a collateral triangles and removing the singularities that uh, appear when you do that. Uh, and, and then, and to say that this, you know, embedding converges exactly to, to, to the area with respect to this embedding, for instance, converges to uh, the Gaussian free field metric, for instance, or something like that. So they are, they are you know, a good, uh, clearly well-defined uh, uh, conjectures around there also. So you see that, um, I mean, maybe to conclude this, this lecture uh, and to the series, that in some sense there are, you know, uh, in so, there's an explosion, if you want, of, of, you know, things that are connected to SLE. So the core, maybe, of SLE itself now is well understood know the sort of SLE business itself uh, but you see you have plenty of uh, very inventive ideas you know that come from all over the places that are usually often related to many other th stuff that has been existing you know floating around uh, before and uh, that one can interconnect or understand better so uh, and also let's put it this way there are also many very clever people around you know <laughs> who are working on this so um, uh, so it's not because there's, there are so many, you know, explosion of uh, ideas and, 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 and uh, new tools and so on that it is a subject that becomes easier to get into, right? Because, uh, uh, but, um, but still, I mean, it's, uh, it's develops uh, well, and so it's quite clear that, uh, so, the relation with Lie algebras and, and uh, sort of algebraic things, you know, was going to be continue to be explored by Julien, certainly. Um, uh, there's this, uh, okay, I haven't told about dimers at all, but uh, maybe uh, Vincent will. Uh, so there are many, you know, uh, from abstract things to actually concrete, you know, like, you know, loops of stories look like concrete probabilistic uh, stories uh, you know that still come together and they're still part of this of a simple of a single uh, unique picture so uh, but now sort of the things become more dive I mean you see the, you have uh, depending on the taste of people you know they will branch into different uh, approaches to, to this story okay so I guess I'm, I should really stop and uh, so tomorrow there will be the uh, in the afternoon, after, I mean, the, in the morning, 9.30, there's uh, uh, Wilson's algorithm, but then there will be these lectures by Pierre and myself. Uh, so they will be, of course, for more sort of not restricted to people from the school. So, so, so it's not a continuation of what we said so far. We cannot build on anything what we said. So, uh, but the, 
I guess what we chose was to have something which was still uh, in the same spirit, but um, uh, so uh, still not still new for you, and, and uh, so so I guess what the question I will try to address. I have still have to prepare my lecture, but uh, as you know, what. Um, whether you know these structures that you construct, you know what what is symmetric and what is not. As soon as you construct, a, you find an interface. You know, so in particular when you are away from the critical point, slightly away but not too much, you can still have interfaces. Maybe if you have a competition, if you have a population picture which is not slightly at a, at a, at PC but slightly away, you know what is symmetric, what is not, what do we believe, what. Is, we believe is true, what we don't believe is true, and, and this sort of thing. So. Okay.